Hello and welcome to Mr. Quakers Teachers. Mr. Quakers Teachers is an online learning hub that provides video lessons and online tuition in English literature and other subjects of humanities in the British curriculum, IGCSE, O level and A level. In today's lesson, I'll be providing detailed analysis of Sonnet 29 by Edna St. Vincent Millay. My analysis will be presented with rolling annotations of the lines and important words and phrases in the poem. I'll emphasize the themes, literary devices, figurative and poetic, tone, structure, language of the poem. You can get the course that provides stanza by stanza, line by line, and word for word written and video analysis of all the 15 poems in the IGCSE anthology at mrquakersteaches.com. The written course has been particularly helpful to students sitting the IGCSE because it provides clear guidance on the approved writing styles. Without further ado, let's demystify Sonnet 29. First, let's speak about the poet. Edna St. Vincent Millet was born on February 22, 1892, and she died on October 19, 1950. She was an American poet and playwright. She encouraged the reading of the classics at home. She was too rebellious to make a success of formal education, but she won poetry prizes from an early age, including the Pulitzer Prize in 1923. For a woman, that's like, I mean, of that period, that's like a, a, a very, very um, striking feat. Now, let's first look at the poem first. The poem is a sonnet, as we can see from the, from the title, and then it's by the author, by the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay. Let's read the poem and then we'll dive into it and tear it apart word by word and then line by line. Sonnet 29 by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Pity me not because the light of day, at close of day, no longer walks the sky. Pity me not for beauties passed away from field to thicket as the years go by. Pity me not the warning of the moon nor that the ebbing tide goes out to sea, nor that a man's desire is hushed so soon, and you no longer look with love on me. This have I known always. Love is no more than the white blossom which the wind assails, than the great tide that treads the shifting shore, strewing fresh wreckage gathered in the gales. Pity me that the heart is slow to learn what the sweet man beholds at every turn. Now, one of the first things we see is that Millet starts the poem by saying that, or like a demand, that no, that she shouldn't be pitied. And the poem is being spoken in the first person. And we see that with the use of the word me. So it's in the first person. She's speaking to the reader. But we are going to see that in line 8, for example, she changes her view and speaks directly to her lover. But let's, let's begin by how she, she, she starts. She says, he says that she makes a plea, presumably because she believes that pity will be the reader's natural reaction to her words. So she starts off by, you know, foreshadowing the fact that she's going to be pitied and she doesn't want any pity. So pity me not. So her plea foreshadows that a love song, a sonnet is simply a love song, that her love song is a sad one, you know, like the way we have like sad love music. And um, that's the same way that Millie presents a poem. A use of a negative not after the pity me also reveals that the poem is written in Old English. So that's a second point about the poem in terms of language. So the poem is written in Old English. And it's, like I've already mentioned, in the first person point of view. And so Millet is speaking for herself and she's trying to, as it were, control the reader's attitude towards her after they've read her poem or what has happened to her in the love. You know, um, when, they, when you speak about a sonnet, the, the main theme of a sonnet is usually love. But unlike Sonnet 43, which is also part of the IGCSE anthology for 2022, Sonnet 29 is like a, a sad love song. You know, Sonnet, like I mentioned already, is a, is a love song. Like it's a sad love song. So in the whole an, um, anthology for 2022, the only two sonnets are Sonnet 29 and Sonnet 43. And I'll make a video that sort of compares both, both poems. And the first person she says she shouldn't be pity for is because the light of day at close of day no longer walks the sky. Now, this is really confusing at first. 
because Mile is saying that if the day becomes dark, don't pity me. But Mile shrouds her feelings in metaphors and personifications. The very first thing we see here is that she is hiding the full manifestation of what's happening in metaphors. And so she says that because the light of day at close of day no longer walks the sky. The very first thing we see is that me the metaphor, light of day is a metaphor for her ex-lover. And close of day is a metaphor for the end of their relationship. And then at, the personification is no longer walks the sky. The sky is a metaphor for melee. Now, why are these metaphors very important? Let me give more detail. Metaphor, light of day. The metaphor for her ex-lover, light of day, attributes brightness and makes it seem like the presence of a lover or being in a relationship with a lover gave me the clear di direction of what her life is supposed to be. So she, she gives her lover the attribute of life or she attributes him with light. It means that he's the one that gave her direction. He's the one that gave her life a purpose. Just like, you know, the daylight allows us to work. That's the same kind of sense that Millet gives to her lover. And she says at close of day, like I mentioned, close of day is a metaphor for the end of their relationship. And she's trying to say that now that their relationship is ended, her life has become dark. So her life no longer has the shine or the luster that it used to in the past. past. And then she uses personification to present the way a, a lover usually reacted with her. No longer walks. And this introduces the theme of abandonment, that she was abandoned. Because the poem, and that poem actually is about Millet being jilted or a broken relationship. And the sky is a, is a metaphor for Millet. This means that Millet thinks that she's inherently dark. She has no light. You know, Millet is trying to say here that the only way I have purpose, the only way I think I'm worth anybody's while or my life is worth anything is when I'm in a relationship with the light of day. So Millet thinks that like the night sky, which has no light on its own, but only receives light, light for example, from the sun, the moon, or any other um, um, celestial light. She's trying to say here that she's the same form. She's dark. She's inherently dark. So you can only see the, the sky or the, 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 the sky when there's light in the, in, the, in the sky. And that's the same thing that um, Millet is trying to say. And this is really important because Millet is shrouding her feelings in deep metaphors. And these are some of the things that you have to be able to present for deeper meanings in order to be given the marks in the IGCSE. Now, we also see the use of enjambment as well. And we see the flow of words from the first line to the second. And I've underlined the words there, they at. So the flow of words from one line to the, um, to the next reveals Millet's unrelenting grief and the fluidity of her thoughts. So she's trying to say here that the, uh, she's so miserable that it's following her every day. You know, it's flowing, it's very fluid, her, her heartbreak is very fluid. She continues in the third line that, pity me not. Now, the second repetition of pity me not qualifies the word pity me not as an anaphora. So she's repeated the first three words in, 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 in the third um, line after she, she did two in the first. So it qualifies as an, an anaphora. It also shows that Mile doesn't want a request or a demand that she make, made to the reader immediately the poem started or the, the, the immediately the poem started to be forgotten. So that, that thing she's saying, her demand of pity me not, she wants it to be at the forefront of the reader's mind. And she says, for be beauty's passed away. Beauty's passed away is a euphemism for how Mile no, is no longer attractive. And she uses euph euphemism. And euphemism is when you present something in a much lighter way than it actually is. And that's what Millet does here. She says, for beauty is passed away. So she's no longer attractive. Her beauty is dead. So that's the point she's trying to say, passed away. My beauty is dead. But she continues that. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is dead. And this is really striking and important because when it comes to life, everybody is going to lose their beauty over time. I mean, the way people look at when they are in their 20s, or in their, in their teens, their late teens, that's not how they look when they're in their 70s or in their 50s or in their 60s. And Millet is trying to say here that that is what is happening to her. But then her love, she uses one of the most, you know, sorrowful um, ideas to present this. And especially because of her use of the contrast here. She says from field to ticket. So field to ticket reveals the 
the polar opposites, like contrast. You know, the way sometimes people have like a before and after image of maybe if they are trying to um, lose weight or something. Millet's own here is that she has a before and the after, but then the before is, you know, nicer than the after. And the field is a metaphor for when Millet was attractive. So when you're writing about it and you want to say that Millet uses metaphor, you can say she uses contrast or you can say she uses metaphor. And she uses the contrast here for when she was very attractive, well-groomed. She was ravishing, beautiful, the object of every man's longing glances, admiration and desire. That's when she was a field. She was well, you know, put together. But Thicket shows here that she's become unattractive. You know, she's become un unattractive. She now lacks the appeal to attract suitors because she has become physically repulsive, undesirable and unattractive. I remember she says beauties and the fact that she says beauties registers that Millet is not just talking about one manifestation in, in terms of her physical beauty but in other regards as well you know uh, how she related to people as sometimes as some people get older they become a bit more um out you know they make people people don't like their company anymore and that's what Millet is saying from beauties passed away it's a bit more you know loving and caring but now she's lost that Fuel to Ticket also provides vivid visual imagery of the contrast between her past beauty before and her present plainness or ugliness after. Emily says, as the year goes by, and I think this is something that the reader has to stick with as the, year, the years go by. What Emily is trying to say is, it's time. Time is what has taken her beauty from her. It's stolen her beauty for, for, from her. And then the truth of the matter is that for everybody, time steals beauty one way or the other. So it's the passage of time that has caused her to be unattractive. In the fifth line, she again repeats the, the anaphora, pity me not. Pity me not here highlights Millet's desperation to control the reader's emotions and also their response. You know, and she also, she's like, this is like she's compelling the reader to say, look at me, I'm emotionally well put together, I'm okay. And she continues and says, the warning of the moon. The warning of the moon. The moon is a metaphor for the romantic relationship between her and her lover. Her importance and her shine. Warning suggests that she has lost her ability to pull a lover and their relationship has been reduced to the extent that it has become non-existent. You know, so she uses the metaphor for the moon, the way the moon loses its shine, the way the, the moon becomes smaller as a metaphor for how their relationship has reduced. And she says that not that so this is another manifestation but she uses not that instead of pity me not here or because the ebbing tide goes out to sea so again here Millet again shrouds her feelings continuously in another metaphor the ebbing tide goes out to sea the ebbing tide is a metaphor for Millet's ex-lover so he's like a tide that has come into the the river as sort of mingled with the river over time and now is he is going back to sea. So goes out shows is also a metaphor for their breakup. They've broken up. The sea is a metaphor for the the her lover's new partner or lover. And the sea is more attractive, it's more pulling. It has you no know, and it, it, remember the idiomatic expression, there is a there's a lot of fish in the sea. So it's like right now, the lover with that is the ebbing tide is going into the sea to you know to attract even more beautiful and nicer. Um, fishes and again this highlights you know Millet's feeling of abandon abandonment and this is really striking because the poem shows us that Millet is really heartbroken she's sorrowful you know she's weeping and then the ebbing tide goes out to sea provides vivid imagery of the water leaving the river and entering into a much larger fresher sea but in this instance Millet's lover is leaving her for a more attractive woman for a more attractive partner and for Millet it breaks her heart and she's heartbroken and she again repeats know that that's the second repetition of no know that which qualifies it as an anaphora as well and she says a man's desire is harsh so soon in this line Millet uses onomatopoeia because the word harsh there you know strings highlights the silence that has followed their relationship you know it and i think it is in this line that Millet first of all manifests that really her love, she's been jilted because all along she's been hiding her feelings behind 
metaphors, but now she exposes it for everybody to see. Hushed suggests that there's silence now. He no longer speaks to her. He no longer tells her sweet nothings. And she says that it happened, it, it was so soon. And you know, while we are reading the poem, we have to understand that here, Mile is going through heartbreak. And if you've ever experienced heartbreak, that's the feeling that Mile is exposing in, in this poem here. So she's, she's heartbroken at being jilted by a lover. We also see the use of the sibilant sound in the line as well. The repetition of the S sound. Sibilance is the repetition of the S sound. She say hush so soon. You know, and there's this quiet. It's as if there's this quiet, this cloud of, of, of silence that overs over her and then falls over her and then is hushed. Suddenly, she no longer hears from her lover anymore. And this for me, the next line is the most touching line of the poem. Because she says here that, and you no longer look with love on me. In the line 8, the point of view shifts. All along, she's been saying, pity me not, pity me not to both maybe the reader and to a lover but here she points at a lover because she, you see the word you there because that's like a second person point of view she's speaking directly to, to a lover and she says you no longer look with love on me and this is a very touching image you know she, the, now for the reader this makes the reader feel a bit awkward because it's like the reader is standing and experiencing two lovers speaking about each other you know after their love have been broken and this, in fact, is the is the is the first sentence or ends the first sentence of the of the poem. You see that with the, in the end, the use of the full stop at the end of that line. And you no longer look with love on me. So she directly addresses her ex-lover. It also creates the 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 effect, like I mentioned, that the re the reader is in the middle of a lover's quarrel. Mille reports that she no longer received love love glances from her ex. You know, he's, he's broken up with her now. And you know, when he come, when this is important because when it comes to love, how people even look at someone exposes the, the love. Because you know, love is an abstract idea or abstract con concept. But there's a way that people look at, you know, their spouses or those that are in relationship with. And then the person just instinctively knows that I'm loved. And Mile is saying here that she no longer receives that. Now, for me, Around this point, from line 9, the tone of the poem sh changes. I think Millet becomes more philosophical. It's like she's, she grabs herself after the first, after line 8. And then she says, this I have known always. I think she becomes more philosophical. So um, if when it comes to the tone, which is an important point that um, the poem speaks about, and I said that in our introduction, I was going to speak about the tone, for example. From the first to the eighth line, Millet's tone is a tone of heartbreak. But from the ninth line downwards, a tone becomes more philosophical, like somebody who is trying to present something bad in a good way. She, so she's no longer, she's sort of hiding her, her heartbreak and then she's presenting them in other ways. And she says here that, this I've known always. Now, if this is, I've known always, if that's really the case, why did she have this experience in the first place? You know, so it's like people who have suffered heartbreak, they tend to present themselves as if they've always known that this was going to happen. You know, they were not in shock, but Emile was actually in shock. And I think that they had the, the, being, um, the, 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 the breaking of their relationship caused Mille to lose her self-esteem. So uh, Mille also says here that she knows how love works. Always suggests that Mille has always known how love works. So why did she become a victim in the first place? You know, but that's, 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 that we know that's untrue. She's not, she's not always known how love works. And we also see a colon as well. So colon indicates that she's about to provide the reader more um, information about how love works. She says, the first thing she says is that love is no more than the white blossom. So you see the capitalization of L in, the, in, in love there. So that's the first manifestation of love. Love is no more. She knows that the highest form that love takes, um, this is the highest form that love takes, and love is a proper noun. Not, I think Mile is trying to say here that she is the manifestation of love. She manifests like pure, undiluted love. And she presents and says that love is a white blossom. So it shows that love manifests physically in good lovers. They are white. And white reveals that love is very accommodating. When it's white, the expression there is that it's very accommodating. When something is white, it's very accommodating. I think we get that sense as well in, um, in um, the other sonnet by Browning when she says that the, the, the width 
So here the wide blossom is some accommodating. Blossom opens in its season, it's colorful, it's bright, and it's very inviting. And when it invites, it's the wind that comes. And she uses the word here, white blossom, not white blossoms. I, so she's speaking about herself, a single experience, her own experience of love. And then she says, which the wind assails. The wind is a metaphor for lovers who rough up and mistreat those that they claim to love. So an example of this for Mile is a lover. He's a wind. He's unsteady. He's pushy. He's uncommitted. But he just shoves her around and he assails her. Our sales suggest that break, the breakup wreck and cause emotional, physical, and psychological pain to the blossom. And she's heartbroken, so she's assailed, you know. So again here, Millet goes back to what she knows how to do already, the use of metaphors, and she, she, she hides her experiences in metaphors and personification. So the wind assails. So there she personifies the wind and to show that the wind has power and the wind is forceful. We also see the alliteration of the T and the W sound in line 10. It says, than the white blossom which the wind assails. Both of them combine to provide auditory imagery of the sadness in Millet's voice and the emotional struggles that she has to endure after uh, experiencing heartbreak. And we also see again that there's like the third anaphora in the poem. Pity me not is an anaphora, nor that is also an anaphora, than there's also an anaphora. She's trying to reinforce the idea that, see, Love doesn't pass this point. It doesn't exceed this point. So she has knowledge. She's very knowledgeable about love. And she continues that then the great tide that threats the sifting shore. That's the second manifestation of love for Mili. The great tide again is another metaphor for the antagonist of love, the bad people of love. Like a lover, he's a great tide. And he comes very powerfully and then he leaves the shore and then he breaks the shore. You know how sometimes great tides come, come into the city or come into a town and pull everything away, you know, like examples of, of um, tsunamis. Then the shifting shore is a, is a metaphor for Mili, for the good lover. She's a good lover. She did all her best. And then I think again here, that shifting shore again shows the accommodating, reinforces the idea that, she, that the good lovers are usually very accommodating. So like the white blossom that is accommodating, the shifting shore is also accommodating and it's willing to be threaded because it threads. So it, it, it's willing to be walked over. So she walked over her emotionally, psychologically and destroyed her self-esteem. And Millet is trying to say that the, the, he is um, the, the, the great tide. She is the shifting shore. She's trying, she tried as much as she could to, you know, to allow their relationship continue, but her lover wouldn't relent. And we also see the alliteration, the addition, the, the sort of the combination of alliteration and sibilance in the 11th line. Than the great tide that threats the shifting shore. So the T, 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 T. And then this is, so both of them, the T, the T and then the, the S sound combine to provide auditory imagery of the moans of pain in Millet's voice as she believes how she was mistreated by her ex-lover. And this is really important because when you're writing in the IGCSE, you, you have to be able to speak about how the writer uses devices, literary devices. So sibilance, for example, is an example of a poetic device and figurative language to present, metaphor is a figurative language that to present the thing in more detail. And she continues in the 12th line that string, fresh wreckage gathered in the gills. So this reveals that bad lovers leave a trail of destruction, emotional destruction. And Mile wants the reader to have in their mind's eye, first of all, from line 10, the wind pushing and shoving and pushing. And then the, she also wants them to have the, the idea of how the flood waters behave, how the, the, the river, the ocean waters behave and comes into the town. That forcefulness. She wants the reader to, to, um, to get this picture in their head because that's the best way for her to present what she, feel, she, she felt at, the, at that moment. And she says, gathered in the gills. So the gills are like heavy storm. So they just leave a, re a residue. String is an allusion to the visible signs of emotional pain displayed by those who are jilted. They are mournful. They have like mournful facial expressions. They have de depressing body language. They like to live in seclusion. These are some of the telltale signs of somebody who, have ex who has experienced heartbreak. And this is what Millet is trying to present. That that's how she feels. 
and it's fresh. So when you see somebody who's suffered outbreak, sometimes, you know, a month later or three um, a months later, it's fresh. It's almost as if it just happened. When they remember it, it's fresh. Even after a long time, it's still fresh. And then the, the, the modern um, uh, manifestation of that word is when we say an emotional wreck. So they, they essentially become an emotional wreck. Gathered in the girls, a metaphor for the throes that people were experiencing in a relationship after it has ended. So it's really painful. People sometimes cannot eat, they can't sleep, and all of that. Gathered also highlights that the pain of heartbreak developed over months, even likely over years. But you know, the the white blossom and the and the shifting shower, they're trying to accommodate their lovers. Even though the lovers want to break up, they're trying to accommodate. And sometimes they do that so much that when the, the relationship finally like sort of implodes, they are broken, they are heartbroken, and they are very de devastated. Milena uses a colon after that line. So in, this indicates a pause and shows that she's about to provide more details. That's in the 12th, the end of the 12th line. In the 13th line, Milena finally says, pity me. For me, I think that all that Milena has been trying to do all along is to gain the writer's attention by her voice. You know, the emotion, the, the, Tone of emotional, I, I know the broken heart from lines 1 to 8. And then from nine, li, lines 9 to the end of the poem, how she, you know, she, she's philosophical, but then at the same time, she also asks for pity. So she finally opens up and demands for pity from the reader. She says here yeah, that this reveals a sense of listlessness because she says pity me. You know, she's saying pity me to people she, 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 she doesn't know. Or she, she you know, she, pity me, like some sort of like, She's looking for public um, pity. So she's listless and she's looking for sympathy. And this for me, I think, is the most overriding desire to be pitied. And we see here, Milebi uses personification and juxtaposition from the 13th to the 14th line. And the personification is when she said the heart is slow to learn. The heart is slow to learn. Just a position is what the just a position of contrast. Another word for just a position is contrast. That she con contrast the way the heart behaves to how the mind behaves. So the heart is slow to learn reveals that for her she thinks that the la the heart takes too long to realize a threat. It is slow to learn is also personification that reveals that the mind is a, it's alive. You know, the the, the heart the, the heart is alive. But then it takes decisions very slowly. And she says, what the swift mind beholds at every turn. The heart is, is controlled by emotions. That's what Millet is trying to tell the reader. The heart is controlled by emotion, not logic. So that butterfly feeling in the stomach and all of that. And then she continues that. What the swift mind beholds, again, a second uh, manifestation. Behold shows that the, 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 the swift mind can see. So it's able to see what the sweet mind notices. Is no, the sweet mind is able to notice flaws in a flash very quickly. And that's the second personification after the heart is slow to learn. The sweet mind is also controlled by logic, not emotions. So it's logical. So the mind is logical. The mind makes um, decisions based on logic, not on emotions. And at every turn for me presents the mind as omniscient, like godlike. The mind is able, nothing, nothing, the, the mind doesn't miss a thing. But then it's the heart that leads people into love, not the mind. So I, I sit where Mila is trying to tell the reader that if only we live our lives controlled by our heart when it comes to love, um, sorry, controlled by our mind when it comes to love, we won't face all the problems that we end up facing. So some of the themes of the poem include broken romance, jilted love, fading beauty, the pain of heartbreak, the impermanence of love and beauty, and heartbreak so love is like i like i mentioned is already the theme of the poem because that's what sonnets usually are about about love but here we are talking about broken romance and the igcse questions are usually couched around the themes so a question that may be thrown to you as how does edna saint vincent Millet powerfully articulate the pain of heartbreak in sonnet 29 or how does um, um, so, um edna saint vincent Millet strikingly use words or imagery to present the theme of broken romance in sonnet 29 and any of those questions are fair game 
Now, let's speak about the structure of the poem because the structure is really important when it comes to poetry. The very first thing about the poem is that the poem is an iambic pentameter. That means that the poem has five metric feet. What that simply means is that there are ten syllables in each line of the poem. An unstressed, a short unstressed, uh, unstressed syllable followed by a long stressed syllable. And you see that, for example, in line four where it says from field to thicket as the day goes by. So a short unstressed syllable. And you can, you can do that with the rest of the poems and try that. Additionally, the poem is also divided in two, into two parts. Below introduces and explains the problem from lines 1 to 12. The third of Volta occurs in the final couplet of the poem, which the poet finally with a revealing that, you know, she, what she truly um, wants from the reader, which is pity. The entire poem is only two sentences. The first sentence is from the first to the eighth line, while the second is from the ninth to the fourteenth line. And this iambic pentameter, the idea of the iambic pentameter is important because it, sh it shows the drum, doom, doom, up, down, up, down nature of the poem as the poem goes on. And the poem also has rhyme scheme as well. We see that in the day sky away by. So A B B A A B A sorry A B A A B A B C D C D E F E F G G. The last two couplets of the line uh, concludes with a couplet G G. So this is an example of an English or Shakespearean sonnet. So it condenses the fourth into one stanza of three quatrains and a concluding couplet with the rhyme scheme of A. B A B C D C D E F E F and then G G. If you've enjoyed this lesson, please visit www.mrquakersteaches.com where you can customize the, with your the way you study with the courses there. We have stanza by stanza, line by line, and word for word written analysis of all the 15 poems in the IGCSE anthology. You can also find analysis of the prose components. So for the prose component like purple eye viscous and drama as well like the crucible P um, notes on the characters the themes conflicts and what's not and also information on the unseen paper if you're writing going to be writing the unseen paper you can also book private lessons tuition group lessons or one-on-one -on -one lessons in english language for the cambridge igcse and a level in english English literature, geography, and history. Or you can join our tribe on Telegram. Just search for Mr. Quakers Teaches IGCSE Literature on Telegram and then join the tribe. So here you have it. Sonnet 29 by Edna St. Vincent Millet has been demystified. Thank you so much for joining the lesson today. Until next time, bye-bye.